good morning, Family Church. Are we ready to worship this morning? God is good. He's worthy of our praise. But he brought me in Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me Who the sun sets free Oh, is free Die for me. Yes, he died.
Jesus. This is how I fight my battles. 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 This is how I fight my battles.
How many know the battle is already won in Jesus? Amen. No situation is too big for him. Your children, your marriage, your finances, your business, God has it all. He has it all. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that we cast our cares on you, Lord. Thank you, God. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. Shaking up the earth and sky, Re 
mighty wind filled the house of prayer and I pray that same thing this morning. Let's lift up our hands and our hearts. I pray a stirring up and a kindling afresh of the gifts in people's lives and that relational connection with Jesus that it becomes first place. Lord, anybody who's never surrendered to Jesus would have a new birth experience. Today's a day of salvation to surrender and submit to him right now to just ask the Lord to forgive us, cleanse us, renew us, Say this with me. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Hallelujah. Now listen, it's, let's turn the lights up. I want to show you something. Let's open up those blinds right now. Don't just open the blinds. Pull them up. I want you to turn around and say hi to everybody in the building. Can you greet one another? Come on, man. This is church. St. Louis Family Church. Yes. live in Troy, don't you? Not like 1,200 miles away? I met, a, I met a sister that's on a road trip from, I think it was Seattle, all the way to Boston. And she stayed at the at Yellowstone, and I, where else, the Tetons, and where else did you stay? I apologize to her that we don't have mountains in St. Louis, <laughs> but we do have church. Come over here and just tell us so we can pray for you. Tell us your name. Tell us what's up. Tell us how you found it. Um, found here? Yeah. Oh, so I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and um, after college, I went through a lot of hard times, and this was my place of, like, safety and comfort, and, like, I'm going to cry. It helped me through, like, a lot, and so every time I'm um, back home, I always find my way back here because my sister lives right up the street, and so my friend is on a, she's moving from Seattle to Boston, and um, asked me if I wanted to go on a road trip. And I was like, sure. And I had a feeling it was a little more than just a road trip because um, <laughs> she likes to camp. So we've been camping out at some of like the most powerful places like Grand Tetons, Yellowstone, Rocky Mountains. And I've had these quartz crystals that I've been planting along the way on these grids and um, kind of just like opening up like portals of love and high frequency just to like really <laughs> bathe in the earth. And so... <laughs> That's and, a trip. It sounds like Southern California. It, 
happens to be that we're in St. Louis for a day. We got in late last night. I'm leaving at four in the morning. And we were pulling in and I go, is tomorrow Sunday? And I go, oh my God, I can go to St. Louis Family Church. Yeah. And yes. Some, something better than the Tetons, the Yellowstone, or Crystals. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray you bless my sister. Adjust their thinking. Help them out in the remainder of the trip. I bind the enemy and I loose your presence to flow, Lord. Because after all, nothing can substitute for the simple, essential presence of the Holy Spirit. And so we pray that, that God, you would bring tremendous clarity to these young ladies. And may they be safe in all the goofy time we're in. In all these places they stop. They're protected, covered, and blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, here. God bless you. Yeah, yeah. I want to bless you with that microphone. All right. Adjustment. Hallelujah. All right. So we're going to get ready to give in the offering. And, um, man, I love giving. Uh, I love the sacrifice of praise. I love fasting. My body doesn't love fasting. My body loves food. But I love the results of fasting more than I do uh, just to, you know, I ate so much. Can I tell you how much watermelon I ate after church on Friday? I, you know, and it's funny because I, there was a huge watermelon. I skinned it. I cut it in half. I ate three quarters of it. I transferred it into my belly. Now, I sat there and wondered, why do I feel so much pressure right here? Because I transferred the contents of a, of a casserole bowl into my belly. At some point, aren't we going to ever learn? I'm going to learn. But you didn't eat three quarters. I, it felt like I did. I, I did not eat a half or something. I ate a lot. I ate too much. I ate too much. But I survived. I'm back to tell you and give, give, you, give you a testimony. Yeah. Hallelujah. Better than crystals. He's a rock of my salvation. Hallelujah. All right. So let's get ready to give him the offering. And uh, you guys, tithes, offerings are God's idea. Uh, yeah, that's what I was talking about, about fasting. Pro, uh, Isaiah 58, as we're going into autumn and it's going to be the last day of summer on the 22nd. Now, I know there's a category of guys in our church that refuse to wear long pants all the way through the cold seasons. <laughs> Your holdouts, and somewhere it's summer, so yeah. But, 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 I, but I want to encourage you to fast and pray, fast and pray uh, about your futures, about the church, about our country, about the season we're in, about a revival in the church and a harvest amongst the lost. And um, I give toward that. I pray about that. Uh, my wife and I were watching some videos last night of experiences we've had in our church years past. And, uh, for us, the best is yet to come. I saw a lot of faces that looked a little younger, but they're still fervent and they're still here. And I'm excited about what the Lord's doing. I'm excited about the, the spirit of God in our lives. I think about just what he's done in, in my life. Um, the thorns just had their, on the, on the 8th, they just had their 60th anniversary. Where are you? Where are you guys? Stand up. There they are. Happy anniversary to you. 60 years. Never an argument. Never a quarrel. God bless you. These guys are so powerful. They've been such a blessing in my life. Just stretch your hands toward them. Say, God bless you, thorns. We love you. Happy anniversary. Give him a big hand, man. That's a beautiful thing. Beautiful. I would, but he's not there. No. He's not. I don't see him. So tell John Moore he had an opportunity to testify, but I can't see him anywhere. Where? There he is. Come on, John. He said, what am I testifying about? <laughs> How about Samuel in Canada? How about Samuel in Canada? Can you testify about that? This is good. It's Pastor John. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. So there's this couple that's been wanting to have a baby for a very long time, and it was, she was like um, one of those deep struggle things. And they reached out to the church, prayer. Pastor Jeff laid hands on a blanket, sent it up to him. She had her baby yesterday, <laughs> named Samuel. Samuel. So we pray blessing on you guys up in Canada. They watch us every week, and we've been standing with you for that, having that breakthrough. I talked to the Deves, and they had a breakthrough of healing. And God is a master of breakthrough, you guys. He is so faithful. 
Who in here would say the Lord has been good to me always? Man, he's been so good to us. And I, I just, he's been good to us, been good to the thorns. Because they're a pit bull, bull Rottweiler combination. They're, they're an interesting breed like Patsy and me. So, um, you know, it takes something to endure. And, uh, you know, butting heads. You know, nobody wins in a head butting. But, uh, but yet, you know, with God, he keeps us standing. And I'm going to talk to you about your stand today. So, hallelujah. Amen. Good to see Debbie Shaw Frank. She's got her coffee, so she's going to be alert and fresh. And there's going to be amen in coming from over there, fueled by caffeine. All right, so let's get ready to sow in the offering. God loves our contributions. He loves our part that we play. Each one of us has a part. Each one of us has a role. And so we're going to just be faithful. There's Haley with her little baby and her cool hat. Haley, stand up and show us your little baby. That is a little treasure right there. There's a little bun fresh out of the oven. God bless you, Haley. I pray blessing on you. Blessing on your babies. Say this with me. Thank you, Jesus, for meeting all of my needs, for forgiving me and loving me, and helping me to follow through on all my commitment to you all the way to the end. You are faithful, and you have won my affection. Amen. seated. Wow. Uh, I want to encourage you. I'm going to be teaching on the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus, but I'm fine-tuning it. And, uh, you know, I feel like the world is using doomsday methodology to stir fear. 
So I'm not going to use end time theology to overstimulate hyperactivity in the church. But what I am going to do is be diligent to preach on a subject that is basically about a third of the Bible, prophetic scripture about the big picture of eternity and including that, you know, I love the first coming because it's changed my whole life and stabilized me. My sins have been washed away. I've been introduced to a father who cares about me. And that, in fact, is our emphasis. Um, but if we have our hope fixed on him, we purify ourselves as he's pure. The, 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 our hope fixed on what he did and accomplished in the first coming. And then also the anticipation of the glory that's going to come as he gathers up the church up in the clouds. It says in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, uh, they were standing there at his ascension. And he's, why are you looking up in the sky? Just as he has left, he's coming back. So uh, I'm enthralled about it, but I'm not just standing mouth breathing with my hands limp by my side. We're called to uh, occupy till he comes. And so my goal as a pastor is to equip you for the works of ministry, to edify you so you're built up, to give you bearing so you can walk in the spirit, walk in love, walk by faith, walk out your destiny and deflect deception and the trickery of the enemy and be on point, be on task, be on target for your whole successful uh, purposes of God for your life. And I want to say this to you, and I'm starting my message now. God's intention is to enable us to win in the battles of life to endure conflict, and to continue to stand in all sorts of situations uh, to extinguish not some, but all of the fiery darts or demonic strategies of the devil. Uh, it, two ideas here. One, Romans 8, 37. It, it, in all these things, Paul said, we overwhelmingly conquer, or we are more than conquerors. Say it. We are more than conquerors. And I appreciate the way this context is laid out. It's not denying challenges. He said, in all these things, we're more than conquerors. Jesus said in John 16, 33, I have spoken these things to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation. He said, but take courage, be of good cheer, stay stable, be strong, stand firm. I have overcome the world. Jesus overcome he overcame the devil, he overcame sin, he overcame the flesh, he conquered so that when we line up with him, identify with him, get under his covenant and under his blessing and under his covering, we could say like David, the Lord is my refuge, the Lord is my, my, my rock, the Lord is my support, uh, because he is in fact present and has designed us and in fact hardwired us to win. In 2 Corinthians 2.14, he says that in, he always leads us in triumph. And the, ca and the beginning of it is thanks be to God. Let's just thank him for that. Thank you, God, that there's an answer to our questions, that there's a breakthrough in the midst of the challenges, that God, you have a plan. You have purposes that you have for us. You have details for us as individuals. You have general things for us that we could grasp and we could retain and understand and walk. We, we, we are to stand. And in fact, I, I just want to talk to you about standing for a minute. And I want to start with Romans, the fifth chapter. So if you have your Bible, turn to it. Romans, the fifth chapter. If you don't have a Bible with you, we'll put it up on the screen. My translation is the New American Standard. You know, you read yours. It'll be maybe a little different, but it'll say the same thing. And, and in Romans, the fifth chapter, in the first couple of verses, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, that verse right there, don't let it just bounce off the top of your head. Let's soak on it. I just had one of our police officers ask me, do you think it's legit that you listen to audio books? Is that, does that, is that as significant as reading a book? I said, well, based on Romans, I went scriptural on him. Based on Romans, the 10th chap chapter in the 13th verse, it says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So, so yes, you, you, can, you can count it as you've, 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 gotten in, and you've got a book in you. It goes, good, because that's the only thing I'm able to do right now. I said, I've been an audio book guy since I started, when I started with cassette tapes with Alexander Scorby. Yeah. And I would, I would, with my Panasonic tape player, I would put in my, uh, yeah, the, the marker of a Christian. And my era was... 
you had a Bible that you had your own leather cover that you tooled yourself. And I got an inexpensive Bible and I went and bought a piece of leather and I, I, I put it on there and, and I, I put carving on it and it says truth. And I carried that around bravely at college and I also carried my Panasonic player. I went to a school teacher in my college and I said, hey, is it okay if I play cassettes? Because uh, they're playing music and, you know, Black Sabbath and whatever. So it's like, hey, can I play my cassette? Yeah, sure, man. It's an equal opportunity, uh, you know, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of cassette tape playing. So it's like... <laughs> Right? Isn't that in the Constitution? Freedom of Alexander Scorby cassettes. Anyway, so I would play those, and I would listen to the word. Faith comes by hearing the word. <clears throat> well, but I think I told the guy that I think, though, when you study the pages and the, the letters on a page, I, for me, it slows me down. It helps me with uh, comprehension. I, I go to the Bible, and I read it sometimes like Billy Graham said, just sit down and read a chapter. Sometimes read a book like Philippians or Colossians or Galatians. And, just, just, and there, there's, a, there's a guy that uh, I've been, I, I put a, a, a ribbons, uh, 10 ribbons in my Bible and it's, you know, read 10 chapters a day. And I've done that on and off. Uh, but it's, any amount you do is more than, than I would have done. So uh, faith comes by hearing the word. But then listen to this word that I'm reading to you. I say all that to say, we've got to be good listeners with this. And, and faith comes by hearing, and it says, therefore, having been justified by faith, justification is where we had a guilty sentence in the court of high heaven that was impossible to overcome. The, the wages and results of it would have been corporal punishment, death. But somebody stepped in who was guiltless and sinless and the personification of purity and said, I will absorb all the sin and toxicity of all of humanity, past, present, and future, and I will be willing to suffer and die in their stead, in their place. Therefore, having been justified by faith in Jesus, um, the guy that was ahead of our Bible school, when he was a young person and growing up in Texas, had a heart condition, and it, it, he lapsed into literal death. He died. And he went to hell because he was from a nominal, he was, this Christian, whatever Christianity there was, it was nominal at best. He, didn't, he never heard anybody say praise the Lord or hallelujah or anything like that. He only heard amen at the end of a grace prayer at a meal, and it was all formal. He didn't know the Lord, and because of that, he, went, he, he descended when he left his body. And he explains in vivid terms the experience he had. Well, when he, he somehow got back in his body by the grace of God, and he gave his heart to Jesus between those moments. Then he lapsed into death again, and then he ascended. He ascended, and he, he said it was a totally different situation. He was being interviewed. I just watched this with my wife. I uh, hadn't seen it in years. He has since passed, but he said that uh, the guy asked him, so you got saved. What, what did you do? I repented of my sins before God and received Jesus as my Lord. The interviewer said, is that simple? He said, yes. He goes, we make it so complicated. The guy said, yes. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's so much potency, so much value, yeah. so much impact in Jesus' name. It's the name above every name. Isaiah said, you'll call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus came on a rescue mission because it's God's intention to enable us, equip us, strengthen us so that we can win in the battles of life to endure conflict, and to continue to stand in all sorts of situations. We've just come through a two-year global pandemic, but yet the church is strong. In fact, can I say, perhaps we're stronger for having gone through it. Because I watched some exercise YouTube, and you know the point of building up muscle from resistance training. They're saying now that the older we get, the better it is actually for us. Uh, we know that aerobics keeps uh, oxygenation. I just talked to Louis Stevenson and Sue, and um, you know he's in communication with my son Kingston. And Kingston said to me yesterday at mealtime, he said, Dad, Louis Stevenson rode his bike 51 miles yesterday. Louis is a little younger than me, but I mean, how did he do that? And he's just so, you know, he's keeping fit. And it said that, and he, and he also said he burned 1,268 calories. I said, what? You know, all these apps that give you all these details. I wish we had an app for our spiritual life, uh, uh, you know. And if our spirit was connected to our central nervous system, we'd be going, I got to read my Bible. I got to do audio. I got to read it. 
But therefore, having been justified by faith, look, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the queen just passed, the longest running monarch in the history of Britain. And what, to me, she voiced Christianity from her life. She talked about Jesus in respectful terms. I have a friend who is a friend of the, her chaplain, and he confirmed this that was real for her. The gospel was real for her. So now she's literally casting her crowns at his feet, the king of kings. And, uh, you know, she was honorable. She, uh, Paul McCartney was only 10 years old when she was coronated as queen. And uh, so this is my whole lifetime. So, uh, you know, I think about the, the amazingness of that. And we lived in England for a while. We were focused on trying to reach Britain in our early beginnings. And uh, I think about uh, this whole amazing uh, thing about, about being this king of kings coming in and stepping in for us and redeeming us. What was I going to say about England now? It just leaked out of my brain. It was so good. Patsy, help me. She doesn't know because I don't know either. It'll come back to me and you'll get it. And uh, it, you'll, it'll be good. Thank you for your mercy. <laughs> Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. How many of you are merciful toward Pastor Jeff right now? Thank you very much. See, we just cooked shepherd's pie because our little sweet uh, uh, daughter-in-law, Maddie, um, she asked, she said she loves shepherd's pie, so it motivated us to do uh, chicken pot pie and now shepherd's pie. They wanted some good, delicious comfort food. So we went online. We found this French guy, I think his first name, Jean-Paul, and he, what I loved about him, 25 minutes of his recipe, he laughed through the whole thing. And including, he had moments like I just did where he forgot to put the cheese on the potatoes. And he went, sacre bleu, you know, and he was like, mama. And he said, mama mia, so he must live close to Italy. And then he, he said, this is sacrilege. This is sacrilege, you know. About the, and I was like, relax, John Paul, you know. Uh, uh, but it was fun because he kept calling himself out when he messed up. But he made, it, he made it like these verses. It was so distilled. And what I'm saying about Britain, there was a guy named J.B. Phillips. He was an Anglican vicar. Um, he was a minister in, the, uh, in, in that church, the Church of England, uh, Anglican. Um, and uh, what would it be called in America? Episcopal. And, and, and uh, had an elegant love for God and also a battle with uh, uh, deep depression, I, which I didn't know till recently. But he, tra- he did a paraphrase called, it's a J.B. Phillips uh, translation of the New Testament. And he said of this verse, since we've been justified by faith, let us grasp the fact that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. Let's just take your hand and just symbolically reach out and grasp the fact and hold it to your heart. We have peace with God, not on the basis of our performance, not on the basis of deeds we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, his mercy. And this grace is sufficient. You're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Not according to works, otherwise we'd be able to boast about it. Then it would be some sort of religious performance thing, and we'd be strutting around in various degrees of righteousness, but we don't have a righteousness of our own consisting of our works. It's an imputed, imparted gift that we don't deserve, we couldn't earn, but we freely receive. Can I hear an amen? Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace, in which we stand, in which we stand. Peter Marshall, the chaplain, I think, of the Senate years past, he is, it's attributed to him that he said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And so this is our stand. And he said, and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And for you guys that are going through battles or feeling like you failed or you've been through some stuff, not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. One translation says, we triumph in our troubles, uh, knowing that tribulation brings perseverance. There's resistance creates muscle. And perseverance, proven character. It shows what kind of men or women we are. And proven character, hope. Hope. 
And hope does not disappoint. Why? Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the precious Holy Spirit who was given to us. God's intention is to enable us to win in all the battles of our lives. We've come through a global pandemic and we're the better for it. Having done all to stand, we stand. I don't like it that it happened, but I love the Jesus who takes us by the hand and walks us steadily through the battle. And he always causes us to triumph. And he makes us more than conquerors in all these things. So if you're a note taker, Ephesians 6, 13 through 14, the end of 13, the beginning of 14, I love how this, it's one of my favorite ideas. Having done all to stand or everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore. Having done all to stand firm, stand firm. I've told you a brief story. Growing up in Southern California, the Rams were the football team of Los Angeles. Roman Gabriel was, at the time of my high school years, the famous quarterback. Uh, he, they were win, you know, some winning seasons and amazing. My, I went out for football as a scrawny little kid. I, had no, I wasn't fast enough for the, to, to be a, uh, in, in that, or strong enough or big enough, but I wanted to participate. And, and handily and fortunately, the coach uh, was also a teacher. They had to be teachers in order to be coaches, and coaches to be, had to be teachers. This was this big, massive uh, man who had been a lineman for the Rams, and uh, just a massive, solid, built guy, huge, um, but also with a gentle teaching demeanor, with a maturity. And he saw me in practice get mowed over by this one particular guy who had more of a physical aptitude than I did. His neck was wider than his head, for example. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> he was a big boy. He was a nice guy, but he just kept mowing me down. He wasn't doing it out of uh, hostility or over-aggression. He wasn't trying to be overly competitive or a hot shot. He was actually a sweet person until he broke my arm uh, a few weeks later. But anyway, the, the coach taught me how to stand because he kept watching me get mowed down because I'd stand up after we took, we'd get in these practices and these drills and I'd just get knocked down because I was, my center of gravity was too high. So he said, come here, let me show you. And he showed, used me as an example. That, you know, not like an example of belittlement or to make you feel stupid or insecure, but it's like he took the little scrawny kid who was trying at least and showed me how to get down low and, and, and run in place and hold up my arms and he said, you just hold your arms up like this and keep running in place. He said, by running in place, you, 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 you're forcing yourself to stay balanced. I thought, this, if I run in, why would I be running in place? So this big bull guy with a wider neck than head, he, he just, uh, well, and he tried to do the same mowing. Only this time, while I was doing this and I was hunched down, and I got down in a little bit lower level, he didn't push me down. I think that's why later on he eventually broke my arm. Um, <laughs> But that's a whole other story, and it doesn't fit into the sermon. <laughs> but my point is, having done everything to stand firm, ladies, men, listen. New people, first-time visitors, listen, let's stand on the promises of God. In fact, right after that, it says, your loins gird about with truth. There's such a lying thing going on in the world. There's so much deception now that we don't know what to trust. Big bureaucratic systems have gotten in lying after lying after lying. It's become fashionable to be deceptive. And the devil, of course, is the father of lies, and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and he tries to undermine us. But listen, the, call every man a liar, but God is true. And he cannot, there, you know, some people say God can do any, he, he, there, there's nothing he can't do. Oh, that's wrong. He can't sin and he can't lie. God, there are some things God can't do. He can't remember your sins because he throws them into the sea of forgetfulness. There are some things God can't do. He, he cannot lie. He cannot lie. Devil's the father of lies. He's a manipulative liar. And when people follow him, they get into that, and it becomes a career thing for them. It becomes a fashionable thing, and it becomes a, they get cauterized in their spirit. So we've got to learn to be discerning. So let's get back to the word because I don't want to drift off on that. Because uh, 1 Thessalonians 3.8, it says that we're to hold fast, hold firm, and, 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 and stand fast, to stand firm in the Lord. Make, make Jesus more important, increasingly so, every day of your life, that I'm standing firm in the Lord. Number three, 1 Corinthians 10.12, the Bible says, let the brother that 
thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. So God wants us to take heed to this. Uh, just like that teacher that taught me the difference between just sort of being oblivious and then standing, standing. We've got to stand, stand uh, uh, for, for what we believe and stand on the hope of our calling and stand on our convictions. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, let us grasp the fact that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That even when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. That if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Oh, the accuser will come in and say, oh, no, no, you messed up. You're a crummy Christian. Now you just got to dial it back. And, you got... and he's there to try to steal, kill, and destroy. So we've got to fight through that. We've got to trust him. In fact, 1 Corinthians 10 13 says, no temptation that has come upon us is uncommon. It's common to all of us. And, and, and it says that, but yet God is faithful. And that, no, and that it says in the rest of it that who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, uh, 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 but with every temptation he will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. God's intention is to enable us to stand, to win, to overcome, to endure every blooming conflict we face. So what our responsibility is continue to stand, stand on the promises of God, stand firm in the Lord. Having done all to stand, we stand. 1 Corinthians 13, 16, I'm sorry, 16, 13. I love it where Paul said, a great door of effective service is open to me and there are many adversaries. My wife and I have watched the significant uh, uh, open doors of the blessings of God and concurrent with that, some amazing challenges and amazing hint, uh, attempts to hinder. And, uh, but yet, we, do, we endure it. Yet, what else do we do? Where else could we go? We have no choice. We can, we're, not, we're not those who shrink back. We don't, there's no opportunity for retreating. I suppose there is, but I'm not going to do it. Because we're to press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And we're to lay aside all the weights, the encumbrances, the sin that so easily entangles us, so that we're not we're baggage free. That's what I love about babies. We had some babies come over to our house. They don't have any baggage. That little baby doesn't have any baggage. But we go through some things in life and we pick up along the line as like, uh, but, but God wants us not just to repent of sin. He wants us to lay aside every entanglement, every weight and every encumbrance, every distraction. And he wants us to be just focused on him, tethered to him. And, and this is really what, we're, what I'm seeing here. We, ha, we stand on the promises of God. We stand up for who Jesus is. We stand firm in the Lord. And, and we stand and take heed so we don't fall. But my, my coach taught me when I was a young person, a little skinny kid. Had no business trying to be a, a lineman in football. And yet I had a destiny even though my career, NFL career possibilities ended. I ended up being the Bible study leader. We had the first string team in here for a couple of years. Uh, Friday night church, I mean, it was a fascinating season. They briefly went, came here and then went back and won the Super Bowl. So God had a plan. You don't know what's going on in, uh, in terms of the outcomes of all the battle and the garbage and the attack that tries to come on your individual life, but God does, and the devil, has in, he doesn't know everything, but he sees indications of your fervency. He sees concerns about your faith. He doesn't want to see your faith built up. He doesn't want to see your encouragement levels go up. I am preaching for the edification of the church, for a revival in the church, and a harvest amongst the lost that we will see hundreds of millions of souls get saved in our lifetime. And listen, I want to just tell you this. It, it says in, in, in uh, Philippians 1, 27 through 28, I love this because Paul's speaking to a good church, the church at Philippi, that he has affection for and interest in. And he's saying, way to go. He's saying attaboys to them because he, and he's trying to uh, supplement them uh, as they're doing good. It's not just like a crisis thing. Like where he, he, he says to him, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I'm, I come and I see you or I remain absent, I hear about you, he's talking to a local church, uh, that you will, are of the standing firm in one spirit. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. The devil comes to steal, kill, destroy. He comes to create division. In fact, Abraham Lincoln during that period where the country was getting breached and, and divided, said a house divided can't stand. So he used the scripture, as did a lot of the orators of the day, because the Bible was so important 
to the mindset of a culture. That's why the devil's working to create a famine of the word in the land, to belittle it, to discount it. It's amazing. But yet God is moving. God is drawing. The word of God is, is forever settled in heaven. He told Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 12, that he watches over his word to perform it. Uh, so here we are standing on the word, standing on the promises of God, standing firm in one spirit. Listen to the rest of this. Standing firm in one spirit, uh, uh, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, for the faith of the good news, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but salvation for you, and that too from God. We're to be unflappable. We're to have a, we're not to let them see us sweat. We're to stand firm in the faith. Not in a fake way, but just, you know what? I have inside information that my God is going to see me through. My God is going to come on door. I talked to the thorns in a 60-year anniversary. And, and I've been candid, my wife and I, of our, our uh, early volatility and our adaptation to one another. We loved each other. We still do, always have. But we went through some tough times. And I don't want to be the guy that embellishes and acts and, and, and you know, cuts and pastes and, 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 and uh, uh, edits my testimony. I've read some biographies of Christians where they edit the testimony. It's like, tell us the battles you went through. The Bible does. It shows where David did great and where David failed. And it shows how he ran back to God. I can relate more to that, more that, more that honesty. We did this shepherd's pie, let me tell you about it. Because our two daughters-in-law said, this is the best, separate from each other without prompting each other, and they're not buttering us up. This is the best shepherd's pie I've ever had. This is the best shepherd's pie. You're my favorite in- in-laws right now, you know. And, and, uh, and this guy, Jean-Paul, was going, sacre bleu. You know, and, he, and he said, you've got to reduce the sauce. You pour in some Worcestershire, and you pour in some salt and pepper, and you put in garlic. Don't forget the garlic. And you, know, and you simmer, simmer the onions. And he said, uh, you get, do not steam them. You've got to get them to the, and I can't even pronounce it. I don't know what he said, but it, the, it's Maillard, the Maillard process. It has to, don't steam it. Then you're just steaming. Huh? Caramelize. Caramelize. Yeah, it's like, why don't you just say caramelize, John Paul? You're whipping in and out. You're, you know, I've heard of Spanglish. I could do that, but I can't do Frenchless. Frenchlish, but he did anyway. But he laughed his way through it. And while he was cooking it, when he'd make a mistake, he'd, he'd go, I, 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 you know, this is ridiculous. But then he kept going. And it just reminded me of so many authentic Christians putting together the recipe of life. And as it turns out, the layering of it, the deliciousness of it, I mean, we worked on it for two days. And our motive was to be able to give, have a meal with the family and then give the kids something to take home. I pulled one of them out of the oven, 350 degrees. It, I put it under the broiler so that the, the cheese and the mashed potatoes, I'm hungry, I'm preaching. <laughs> you don't want to shop hungry right now because everything is $1,200, but I'm preaching hungry, so bear, bear with me on this. And I, I was talking to Kingston and about the things of God, and I, I pulled two of them out, put my hand, the oven mitt under it, transferred it, transferred it, got this one, I mistakenly grabbed the edges, and it went, I had a surplus, we made a lot, can I tell you how happy our dog was, isn't that funny, what was my, what was my misfortune, was his, was his benefit, he looked at me, I mean, he curled up with me. I'm probably going to be his favorite for the next two weeks. He mopped up the floor. (laughs) Uh, But what I liked about it is what I like about this message. And it's like this reduction sauce, this, this intentional, like, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's like all the vapor is steamed off of that, and it's just this pure, you know, um, Joe and Stacy went on a trip to Italy, and they found a special, uh, the, the um, vinegar, the uh, balsamic, and they, they, found, they, they got me some really special, and it's, re- it's reduced, and uh, so I'm so excited about it. I hid it from you, so you can't borrow it. 
I made the mistake one time. I let some of my kids taste some that I had. It's so, it took 25 years for them to make this. The kids bought it for me for Father's Day. And then I made the mistake of, let's all taste it. And well, that was it. Then it was gone. It's like, where did my gift go? That's a smart thing. Give the gift. Hey, I'll let, yeah, let's share that. That's actually kind of what Jesus has done in the kingdom, though. He's done all this elaborate work, and then he goes, hey, y'all, come on in. Eat my shepherd's pie. Here's my reduction sauce. It took everything I could do to make it, but consider the fact and grasp the fact that in Jesus there's forgiveness of sin, there's salvation, there's mercy that triumphs over judgment. And so having done all to stand, we stand. And then I've got just a couple of points. Number one, we, as we stand, are to Pray without ceasing. Paul said in Philippians, the fourth chapter, the sixth verse, and the New Living Translation, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Boy, this has been handy for me through the battles of life. When I didn't feel like praying, but I say, God, I'm going to turn my concerns and my worries into prayer because like 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 and 8 says, casting all your cares, anxieties upon him, because he compassionately is concerned about you. And so we do. We concentrate on that today. Yeah. Grocery bills. We know that my God will feed us. Yeah. A roof over our head. My God will sustain us. Yeah. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said he's the head of it. He said I'm going to build it. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's generally over the body of Christ. And that's specifically over each one of us as members of the body. Faithful is he who calls you. He'll also bring it to pass. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. The King James says the perfecter of our faith. We're in a growth potential, but we're also in a growth process. So when I talk to this couple, they've been married 60 years, and we have this knowing together. Oh, we've been through some stuff. We're strong-willed. Yeah, we, we have different personalities. And yet we learn to not just manage but to really, and not ignore the differences, but learn to flow, and we become better for it. I see that on your family. And, and it's just a powerful moment we're in as a body. And God's called us to be a house of prayer for the nations. Yeah. Oh, years ago, we were praying about this, brought in some meetings. We had some interesting times in this ministry. Yeah. And I believe it's all downloading for the seasons that are coming upon us. Everything we've experienced, all that we've been through, we're to rejoice in. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various temptations, tests, and trials, knowing that the trying of your faith produces perseverance and endurance. And and let that have its work in you. It says this echoed in Romans 5. It says it in James chapter 1. And uh, so we just maturely count it all joy. We see trials and challenges, and so... We don't worry about things. We pray about things. We pray about our country. We pray about our city. We pray about our seasons. Number two, we focus on God and what he wants us to do, and we stay in our assignment. We focus on God. Somebody just complimented me today. Pastor Jeff, you've been staying focused the last two years. I've had to in order to provide good leadership through this battle. I've had to go back and say, now, what really matters? Because there are a lot of voices, and they all have significance. And it's like, how do I gradate? How do we prioritize? This seems really important medically. This seems really important economically. This seems really important societally. This seems really... So it's like, they all are important. Nothing, however, can even touch how significant the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the gospel that we've been given and the necessity to live this life for Jesus, we've got to stay focused and get our, he said he'll keep us in perfect peace if our minds are stayed on him, fixed on him, focused on him. Fixing our eyes on Jesus is what we're doing right now. That's why I like church services. Uh, I like participation. I know a lot of people are watching online. Josh's mom, God bless you. People in other countries. The other day we had a guest visiting us, and he said his friend from, a pastor friend from Arizona was watching the Friday night meeting. It's like, well, the technology's awesome, but nothing can substitute for personal face time with Jesus and with each other. Nudge somebody next to you and say, man, I'm glad you're here. If you're really glad, just punch him in the shoulder. Just let him know it. Let him feel it. Come on. Number three. 
as we stand, listen carefully. Number one, we pray and make sure our, our, our relationship with God is, is healthy. I've had seasons of my life where God's never changed, but my, my, I have, and um, he doesn't move. You know, I heard a story about, you know, back in the day with bench seats, and there was this young couple, and, and, and it was before seat belts, and, and so the girlfriend was sitting right next to the guy, and he was cruising with the, with the windows open, driving down the road, and this elderly guy, they were kind of walking and going for a walk, and he, he, he looked at him, and he saw the two, and he said, wow, remember, remember when we used to, you and I, you sit with me like that? He, she said, I haven't moved. He moved. He, he moved over. I haven't moved. So she's right there. And Jesus never moves. He's, he's, he's as present now as that elation of the beginning of our Christian moment. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He, he's present to help us. He's a heavenly father that wants to be with us through the duration. And I think about Jim and Virginia Armstrong. And I think about Reinhardt and Annie Bonnke. And I think about some of the amazing elders of my life that modeled childlike faith as they matured into advancing years and had a twinkle in their eye and had a love for Jesus and it wasn't pretentious and it wasn't on and off again. And you guys, St. Louis Family Church, that's what revival is. When we pray and make him priority, we focus on him and make him priority. Jesus, it's all about you. Number three, we avoid others' offenses. We avoid, the Bible says, the beginning of strife is like letting out water, so abandon a quarrel before it begins. There, the devil wants to create contention to get people in strife and uh, to hinder the flow of the power of the Holy Spirit in this hour. And so the Bible says not to associate with an angry man or you'll learn his ways and become like him. Bad company corrupts good morals. And it also says to uh, get involved with somebody else's offenses is like grabbing a dog by the ears. You know, when I was out of town, I was visiting a missionary, and they had a pit bull for a pet. And uh, I sat in the kitchen, and I was just sitting there at the table, and this pit bull came in from out of the house. They opened the door, and he came in, and he ran in, and he got to introduce himself to the guest. And he, and he, and he, sat, he put his head right here. So I was sitting there, and in my head, I was thinking, they, they sense fear. They sense fear. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. My blood pressure went up. I was exuding all those hormones, you know. Don't be. I was trying to talk myself out of it, and it was getting worse. And this thing's head was the size of an alligator. You know, it has, you know, just it's just this big old giant head just built for, for biting. In fact, later on that week, a cow drifted onto this person's property, and the dog went and, and mistook it as an intruder, and latched onto its front pot roast, and hung onto it. The, do, the, the, the cow stepped on the dog, just not out of uh, meanness, but just broke his hip. The dog was still hanging on him, holding on, while his leg was flopping. It was crazy, and I thought, that could have happened to me in the kitchen. The cow exhibited more fear than I did. It was because, of, you know how cows, you see the white of their eyes, like, you know, it's like, you know they're freaked out. He took, the, the guy took his dog to the vet, and the, the dog said to him, in English, for my benefit, why do you have such an aggressive breed dog? You know, so it was, you know, they're nice, but this one was uh, scary. But then in the illustration of the, getting involved with somebody else's strife is like kind of trying to grab that kind of dog by the ears. Now, see, when he came in and I was sitting at the kitchen like this, and his head was right there, and it was like, up in my business, and I could have just grabbed his little ears, his little cropped ears. Well, then, yeah, he would have really got me. <laughs> Getting involved with somebody else's strife at the workplace, in your family, in this whole array of division over these social issues is like grabbing a dog by the ears. It's not going to get in control. It's not going to be good. So, we have got to pick our fights. We've got to understand we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This is not a human battle, and it's essential that we get on track with these things. Now, let me say something. I've watched this in the cycles of Christian life in church. 
People that get offended insist that they gather people around them because then it justifies their offenses. So misery demands company. And, it, and, and so then it, it's like, yeah, this supports my frustration toward that group or that person or that individual or that, you know. And so then it develops a culture in and of itself. And it's, it feels, now get ready for this, rebellion feels like the anointing because it's exhilarating. It has a focused cause. It's like, yeah, and it's usually reactionary to something else. Oh, we're going to be the remnant. We're going to do it better. We're, we're the anointed ones. They're not. And it, that, that's an evil component the devil tries to alight upon the church. He'll try to do it in neighborhoods. He'll try to do it with uh, people groups. He'll try to do it with socioeconomic variables. Uh, and he'll try to do it in the church. Man, I was in a meeting when I was a kid, and a guy got up and basically said, we're a full gospel church. We've really got the market corner. And I had a check in my spirit. I didn't even know what my spirit was or what a check was. I just didn't bear witness to it. I thought, that's not right. The body of Christ is awesome. And just because people have concluded some different variables in their theology, man, Jesus is Lord. And if they've received him as their Savior and they love the Bible, man, they're my brothers and sisters. And I'm not going to enter into a bunch of petty garbage and rivalry. Remember what I said about Philippians, standing firm in one mind. See, that's why Jesus prayed in his priestly prayer in John 17, that we would be one as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. I mean, the mystery of the Trinity and that unity uh, is also mysterious for the church. And no human movement can pull it off, but our prayer can and our individual commitment to the Lord can, and that cohesion then can come. But we must be careful about taking on the strife of others. Murmuring, gossip, complaining, strife, over and over again, demeaning and belittling. It's the devil's tool to get us out of revival and hinder the harvest. Because who wants to come to that? This is how they're going to know we're his disciples, that we love one another. Boy, this is a delicious shepherd's pie today. It's got a reduction sauce. I'm not even going to tell you what I put in it because then you'll know my recipe and I won't be at the top of the heap with it. But I will tell you this recipe. And if you Google the guy, his name's John Paul, and he'll, he'll make you laugh while you're cooking. Just watch out when you pull it out of the oven that you don't drop it. Number four, spend more time with God than with people. When I met my wife... She wanted a fellowship with God. I would say, hey, let's go to Denny's. No, no, I, I, I want to get up and spend some time in prayer. I have to get up early to go to. She, it was, I feel sorry for her. When she was teaching high school, so she had to get up really early in the morning. And I was working another job that was later in the day, and I had my classes in college that uh, later in the day. So I could sleep in, but, she, but I, I, I didn't care. I had to be with that girl. And I, I you know, it. it School started at 7.30, so, she, you know, I was like, I was, I, was, I was resting before the Lord. But <laughs> I heard a minister talk to another f- minister friend, and he was at a conference, and he was getting ready to preach, and, and the, the guest that was there, he saw him, he said, hey, what, what's up? He said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to get my notes together. I'm really, and he said, I find that, um, if, if we spend more time with God, God will help us with the notes. And I want to say that, that this is a person-centered movement, not a principle-centered movement, meaning God wants us to, like Adam and Eve, meet with him in the cool of the day and connect with him. And we're getting ready to have autumn on the 22nd here in Missouri, and everywhere. But we, we could go outside, like yesterday was so hot and humid, my kids came over, and they had the shepherd's pie. They were throwing skipping stones on the pond uh, across the street. And so then uh, it was blazing hot, but all of a sudden a, a cold front came in. This is what I love about Missouri. If you hate the weather, just wait 10 minutes. It'll all change. That's what I see you guys with. You know, you've got track uh, gym shorts and, and uh, uh, down jackets, you know. It's like just, just in case because we're in St. Louis. <clears throat> But I say, let's just savor. I love green trees, but I also love bear trees. And we might as well, because they're half of the year they're bare. What I like about bear trees is you can see farther past them. What I like about green leaf trees is they cover up uh, all the shenanigans going on around us. So I like both of them, right? 
And uh, I love this stand God's called us to take. I'm out of time. I, that little kid is, I hired the, in that one too. They're telling me, Pastor Jeff, finish with this last point. Number five, don't fight the wrong war. Don't fight the wrong war. In the early church, the disciples had animosity toward the Samaritans. It's kind of like the church. I'm a Baptist, I don't like you Methodists, or I'm a Methodist, I don't like you Presbyterians. I'm a, I, I'm a, I'm a Presbyterian, I don't like the, uh, you know, your group or this group. It's all that, listen, we need to stand together. In the end time church, there's going to be such cohesion amongst the body of Christ. Jesus will do it. We might as well get some lead time on it and just end up loving the whole body of Christ all over the planet, right? Every continent, all nations, every ethnicity, all peoples, and love the church. Jesus said, I love the church. He loved the church so much. He told husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and laid down his life for the church. We're to love our wives as Christ loved the church. So what he's saying is, he's implying Jesus really, really loves what's going on amongst his people. He said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth is going to be bound in heaven. I'm going to give you authority. You tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. I'm going to give you access to the throne. You're going to be able to pray to me in the name of Jesus and you're going to get results. You're going to be able to stand firm on the promises and obtain your healing and get a hold of faith and stand on the purposes of God. Just don't let uh, offended people get under your skin and take on their offense. It's like grabbing that pit bull by the ears. Because once you do it, it's like a bad news deal, man. You try to let it go, it'll really get you. And then so, we need to understand, uh, we started, that this is how I fight my battles. We're standing on the promises of God and we're picking our fights. I think the thorns would tell you, Patsy and I can tell you, We've had to pick our fights with our marriage, with our kids. Some things are more important than other things, and it prevents pettiness and bickering and, you know, and, 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 and nagging and that kind of thing, or evasive action and all that weird stuff. It gets us into the reality of life. I love going to a church where people have been married 49, 50, 60 years because it shows durability and it shows that this stuff can work. I've known Christians that have been living for God for, for decades the people that were over me and the Lord were in advancing years when they first started to bring equipment to me. So I've lived with the treasured truth that this gets better the farther we go. It it's not like, oh, remember the honeymoon? Now we got to turn it over and get a new, new and improved model. Like you see modeled out of Hollywood. It's like, no, you don't keep doing that. You stick with what you have and build with it. Let's all stand up on our feet. Boy, I just had a good word right there for somebody. Look at somebody next to you and say, having done all to stand, I stand. <clears throat> now look back at him and say, quit talking to me. <laughs> if you keep coming back, I'm going to have all my rapture and second coming teaching so refined. It, it may, I, actually, the rapture may happen before I get to the message, and then it's going to be amazing. And we'll all know exactly what the details are, right? Say this with me. I'm standing firm in the Lord. I rededicate my life to God's will and purpose. I'm not interested in strife. I'm not going to be distracted. My Christian walk is improving every day because Jesus is Lord over my life. The Holy Spirit is strengthening me. I'm walking by faith walking in love, walking in forgiveness, and I bear no ill will. I am developing, maturing, growing, and being all Jesus wants me to be. By his strength, and he gets all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Go out and make some shepherd's pie. Have a good day. God bless you.